Much of our attention has been uh, focused of late on the rise of the imperial presidency, uh, the president's use of executive orders, uh, discretion, wide discretion, creative interpretation to advance policies often contrary to legislative authority. Uh, to the extent that this can remind us, if we have a broader historical view, as we do here at Hillsdale, uh, of, reminds us of the prerogative powers that kings used to use to get around the rule of law, things like that which launched the American Revolution. It's a grave threat to liberty, but it's also a symptom of something else, and it masks another problem, which is the complete and utter collapse of Congress as a constitutional institution, uh, the collapse of the legislative body itself, and thus its inability to check the modern executive. Uh, that institution's muscles are so atrophied to the point where to exert pressure against the modern executive, they what? Turn to the courts, sue them. Good luck with that. We now have to ask the question, where do we begin to rebuild a constitutional Congress? How do we begin? Or whether we can begin? Is it still possible to do so? One person who's been thinking about this and writing about this very well is our guest today. Chris Muth uh, is a distinguished fellow at the Hudson Institute here in Washington, D.C. He was president of the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research from 1986 to 2008. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Chicago Law School. He was in the Richard Nixon administration, where he worked on urban and environmental policy, and then in Ronald Reagan's administration, where he was at the Office of Management and Budget. And in between, he taught at the Harvard uh, uh, Kennedy School. Uh, he writes uh, extensively and very well and has a wonderful cover story I commend to your interest. Uh, uh, with the weekly standard on this question and is speaking to us today about recovering a constitutional Congress. Chris Smith. Matt, thank you very much. President Arn, Mrs. Arn, ladies and gentlemen. I know there are many students here. This is Hillsdale, so ladies and gentlemen, covers all of the students I know. It is mid-September, which is an ideal time to observe Constitution Day in Washington, D.C. The three constitutional branches, legislature, executive, judiciary, are back from their summer breaks. They are regrouping and laying plans for a new season of checks and balances. <laughs> the scheme of separated powers was ordained by our powder-wigged founders 228 years ago, and yet here we can see it in real time and modern dress, a living, breathing, perspiring organism, and classically American, government by organized rough and tumble. Our Constitution is often treated as a reliquary, worthy of reverence but no longer of much practical use, filled with outmoded requirements that are impediments to sensible, businesslike government, must be worked around or politely ignored. Yet the Constitution reflects in many deep and subtle ways the character of the people who established it and who have lived and prospered under it for centuries down to today. This is particularly true of, of its structural features of federalism and separated powers, which embody Americans' democratic nature, our distrust of power, and our taste for open competition. The struggle for power and advantage is a constant of human society. In democracies, that struggle is organized and advertised in political campaigns and elections. It is equally present within government, but here it is not always observable. In the parliamentary system of Europe, parliamentary systems of Europe, open competition ends with the election returns and the formation of a government. At this point, legislative and executive powers are fused. Struggles over policy, personal advantage continue, but are shrouded, working themselves out in private within the ministries and leadership councils. A well-led government can present a unified, 
dignified, confident face to the public, the press, and the opposition in Parliament. That is seldom possible in the American sy system. Here, competition in government is naked, out there, exposed for everyone to see. The two political branches possess separate electoral bases and are assigned powers which overlap somewhat but include important independent elements. So they are codependent and must work out their differences in public. Presidents, executive officials, Congress folk may bring to the fray astute tactics, compelling rhetoric, but inevitably in the heat of contention, they are also prone to diatribes, bluffs, missteps, backtracking, humiliations, dignified, our process is not. Europeans who disdain our cowboy capitalism may think we have a cowboy government to match. Parliamentary systems have strengths, but open competition is the American way. Checks and balances are an important means <clears throat> of policing the corruption and abuse that arise whenever power is monopolized. They are also a means for pursuing two things that Americans care about especially, limited government, and humble leaders. The sheer cumbersomeness of the constitutional structure usually requires extended negotiation, leading to a substantial consensus before the government can act. The spectacle of continuous public extemporizing makes it difficult for our leaders to pretend that they are in command of events. Joseph Schumpeter observed that the Democratic leader, quote, might be likened to a horseman who is so fully engrossed in trying to keep in the saddle that he cannot plan his ride. Americans can see that every day. But the whole thing depends on a reasonable balance of power among the three constitutional branches, and we are losing that. In recent decades, power has shifted dramatically away from Congress, primarily to the executive, but also to the judiciary. Part of the shift has come from presidents, executive agencies, and courts seizing congressional prerogatives. This is the part of the story that has been so much in the news recently. President Obama has effectively rewritten important provisions of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, immigration, other statutes, while circumventing the Constitution's requirements of Senate approval for senior executive appointments. The Environmental Protection Agency has contorted the Clean Air Act beyond recognition to regulate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and it has done so after Congress declined after extended deliberation to embark on such regulation for the time being. The Supreme Court has acquiesced in most of these executive usurpations, not all, but most, while taking on itself the authority to decide live political controversies such as same-sex marriage. It played both rules, roles last July just before leaving town. First, the court approved the Obama administration's unilateral extension of tax credits to persons who purchase health insurance on the federal Obamacare exchanges. Then, the next day, it ordained same-sex marriage as a constitutional right calling a halt to the, to the diverse efforts of state legislatures in wrestling with the issue. Now the court is back. It is suiting up for its new term that begins October 1st, where it will face many more cases asking it for the, uh, to approve executive legislating or to legislate on its own account. But the most important part of the story has a very different plot. In fact, almost the, obvious, uh, almost the op uh, opposite. And the first of three propositions I hope that you will take away from this talk is that Congress itself, despite its complaints about executive and judicial poaching, has been giving up its constitutional powers voluntarily, proactively, indeed with great alacrity. Beginning in the 1970s, Congress has delegated broad lawmaking authority to a proliferating uh, uh, array of regulatory agencies, beginning back then with EPA, OSHA, NHTSA, uh, many others, uh, all the way through the Obamacare and Dodd-Frank statutes in 2010, which created many more councils, bureaus, agencies, and gave them highly discretionary power. 
Under this dispensation, members of Congress vote boldly for clean air, safe products, sound finance, against discrimination against the handicapped, but they leave the real policy decisions, often with economic consequences of hundreds of billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars per rule to the executive branch. In recent years, Congress has even handed off its constitutional crown jewels, its exclusive powers uh, to determine government taxing, spending, and borrowing. Several agencies now collect and set taxes or gen generate revenues on their own in other ways and spend the money on themselves or grant programs of their own devising without congressional involvement. The con consequences of congressional self-enfeeblement are vividly on display in Washington as we celebrate Constitution Day. Congress is now under management of conservative Republican majorities in both House and Senate, and it is facing a left liberal president with a big agenda. One would think that Congress would be busily reclaiming its constitutional authorities and exercising them to moderate. Not check, doesn't have the power to do that, but at least to balance the president's actions. This is not happening. A harbinger of the current disarray came right after last fall's elections when the president lost uh, his party's majority in the Senate when he announced several revisions to immigration policies that many Republicans opposed on policy or constitutional grounds or both. Congressional sources promptly announced that the new Congress would forbid those changes through a rider to its appropriations for the U.S. Customs and Immigration Service. A day or two later came an embarrassed retraction. Staff somewhere on the Hill had just discovered that this agency finances itself through its own fees and is completely independent of congressional appropriations. So, sorry folks, there's nothing we can do. Now, <clears throat> Congress actually could do something. It could put the agency back on regular appropriations, but as it has turned out, even that would not help. It has been unable to pass any appropriation bills. There are supposed to be 12 of them uh, passed covering various uh, sets of executive agencies, and here we are, just two weeks before the 2015 fiscal year begins on October 1st, uh, with no uh, ab appropriations for any of the agencies. Congress will be obliged to resort once again to a continuing resolution, a CR. A CR is a blunderbuss last minute statute that simply extends last year's budget for the entire federal government with broad percentage adjustments here and there. The CR is a surrender of Congress's power of the purse. When Congress is appropriating individual agencies, it can adjust program spending and policy elements on a case-by-case -case basis. When I was working in the Reagan administration, uh, the Congress did that to us uh, all the time. It doesn't always get its way in the face of a possible presidential veto, in my view, trying to reset immigration policy or defund Planned Parenthood in this manner would be very complex and risky, but at least Congress is in the game with a multitude of tax tactics and avenues and potential compromises in play. In contrast, the, shut, the, the threat under a CR of shutting down the entire federal government is simply too disproportionate to any discrete policy disagreement, no matter how fervently held. It would be plausible only in the case where congressional opinion amounted to veto-proof majorities in both uh, chambers, in which case Congress wouldn't be using a CR in the first place. Even when Congress thinks it has the president cornered with an unpopular position, uh, such as in the wake of the horrible Planned Parenthood uh, revelations, the game of CR chicken always comes down to a national crisis. The president is always the center of attention and debate and he always has the upper hand. The contrasting circumstances this Constitution Day of the President are complementary evidence of the drift. Since his party lost control of the Senate last November, the President has launched a variety of very aggressive executive initiatives, such as imposing comprehensive uh, national regulatory controls over the Internet. I believe he was within his constitutional rights to do so on the internet matter, but such an enormous, monumental change in national pu 
national policy, almost certainly going against majorities in both houses and certainly and at the relevant committees would have been simply inconceivable in the past. <clears throat> and today, the remarkable thing about President Obama is that with 16 months to go uh, in a two-term, highly contentious presidency, he is not a lame duck. He is not close. It's not that he is highly popular. His popularity ratings have been in the 40s up to into the high 40s. His disapproval ratings have usually always been higher than his approval ratings. So this is not uh, it. It is rather that the nature of the presidency has changed since the term lame duck uh, came into, uh, into usage. A political scientist named Richard Neustadt wrote a book called Presidential Power in uh, the late Eisenhower administration. Uh, it argued that the president occupies an intrinsically weak office. Therefore, to accomplish his agenda, he must devote himself to continuous persuasion and popularity seeking. The book became the White House operating manual for the JFK administration and every president afterwards until the present one. <clears throat> what has changed is that the evolution of executive branch autonomy has made the president intrinsically powerful. He is capable of moving policy mountains on his own. And the, pre the uh, pr president and his political aides, I believe, are the first to have figured out that Neustadt is obsolete. Uh, he works on his political base. Uh, he works on uh, fundraising for his party, but he has for years been relatively indifferent to uh, th uh, the esteem that he has held by the general public and by Congress. He has the wherewithal in downtown Washington, right in this building and in buildings around us, to make policy all by his lonesome, which he will do all the way through the morning of January 20th, 2017. Now, my title says I'm going to tell you how we should revive a constitutional Congress, and I'm going to tell you that uh, fairly uh, briefly. I have a five-part plan. I've observed that five-part plans are popular in attention-getting. There are five-part plans for dieting, uh, preparing for a job interview, blind dating, and so forth. So I thought this might work for me. Um, the, uh, step one is uh, to immediately retrieve the constitutional borrowing, taxing, and spending authorities where Congress has handed these off to the executive branch. It should not be done in the midst of policy contention with the president. Uh, all agencies uh, should be put on annual appropriations. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, to take one of many examples created by the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, is uh, an agency of independent means. Uh, it lives on uh, a slice of the profits of the Federal Reserve uh, banks. Uh, I believe that Congress should take that back, make it subject to appropriations, and appropriate for the first year exactly the slice that it was going to get. So there's no reason, so it presents the constitutional issue starkly, and through a series of steps like that involving the borrowing power, taxing power, to take back those authorities. Second, resurrect the spending power. We have a statute, goes back a long time, you pass a budget in April, and by the end of the summer you put 12 appropriation bills on the president's desk. Uh, we got off to, a, the Republicans got off to a pretty good start, uh, but uh, have had a lot of problems uh, recently. Once you have the appropriating power, uh, the Republicans, for example, could use it to lay out their own spending priorities, uh, and also uh, tweak, in some cases override, uh, what the executive branch is trying to do. In some cases, it could do so uh, in ways that the president would not countenance, that he would veto. So we would have uh, a drama that might play into the uh, 2016 uh, elections. It would provide a, a vivid contrast between the Republicans and Democrats. But also, and just as important, to seek compromise uh, among with congressional Democrats uh, sufficiently to be able to put spending bills on the president's desk that would move significantly in Republican directions, but that he would actually sign. So we'd actually, actually have some real progress. Uh, third, uh, regulate the regulators. Uh, most of our laws are now in the code of federal regulations, uh, not in the United States uh, code of statutes. Uh, in the coming years, Congress is going to have to relearn 
the lost arts of lawmaking, uh, which involves making compromises and settling for half loaves. Uh, uh, there are a host of areas uh, where there would be bipartisan support today if Congress wanted to oust the regulatory agencies in areas of financial regulation, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, EPA, there are many areas of, uh, of compromise uh, where they could uh, replace regulations with law today. Eventually, uh, we're going to have to rewrite the Dodd-Frank Act, the Clean Air Act, the Obamacare statute, and many, many more. This is going to, these statutes involve vast delegation. To actually have Congress making the decisions is going to require a different kind of a Congress. To do these first three things I've mentioned requires difficult overarching steps four and five. Uh, four is to restore hierarchy in the Congress. In the late 1960s, early 1970s, Congress dismantled its internal hierarchy, its seniority system, and its system of, ver of strong autocratic committee chairs. The system had been um, uh, discredited to a significant degree because it had been dominated by Dixiecrats who had used it to forestall civil rights legislation for a long time. Uh, they were in decline, uh, but that was a long time ago. Uh, since then, Congress has become uh, atomized. It is not a hierarchy. It is a large congregation of single-member uh, activists uh, who leave big decisions to the executive branch and then lobby those decisions on behalf of local and national constituencies. The executive branch is naturally specialized and hierarchical. A Congress that can counterbalance it is going to have to become newly specialized and hierarchical uh, itself. I think it has to cultivate a strong internal meritocracy and uh, uh, in this uh, conception we would have strong uh, committee chairmen. Uh, they would not be unten they would not have uh, life tenure as in the past. Uh, they would be accountable but they would have substantial authority while they reigned. Uh, this is not a fantasy. Uh, I am a great fan of Congressman uh, Paul Ryan, uh, and he is my uh, exemplar in this regard. Uh, 2012 uh, Republican nominee for vice president. He was a natural to join into the uh, 2016 presidential sweepstakes. He said, no, I'm going to stick to my legislative knitting as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And chairman of the Ways and Means Committee is becoming a more powerful office uh, once again. Fifth, and here uh, for people who are inside Washington uh, and are Republicans and conservatives, I'm going to be walking into treacherous territory. Cut back to near abolition, the Senate filibuster, which effectively requires 60 rather than 51 votes to pass a bill, and the Senate hold, which means that individual members can prevent scheduled motions from reaching the, uh, the floor at all. Uh, these procedures were rare uh, in the past. Uh, employing them was onerous and strongly discouraged. Today they are frequent and, uh, and costless. Republicans and conservatives like these practices, and Democrats and progressives oppose them because both sides see them as slowing the pace of lawmaking and therefore of government growth. This construct is badly out of date. The great engine of government growth today is executive lawmaking, punctuated by spasms of legislation such as Dodd-Frank and Obamacare that propel new executive uh, exertions that Congress is then uh, helpless uh, to moderate. Uh, the filibuster and the hold have become me mechanisms of legislative passivity in the face of executive growth. Congressional lawmaking cannot hope to keep pace with executive lawmaking unless the Senate drops its House of Lords pretensions and becomes a majority vote legislature. Now, um, I said before that Congress has not uh, been reviving its constitutional powers. And aside from the uh, few steps it's taken toward reviving the appropriations process, it's doing none of the things uh, that I suggest. And if we read the media, the media's got an answer. <coughs> it is partisanship 
and dissension within Republican ranks. Uh, these are unwieldy groups in the House and Senate uh, because of all of these feisty Tea Party insurgents who will not take orders uh, from the old establishment, who want to confront President Obama and the DC status quo uh, head on. There's some truth to that, but I think it is highly superficial. And the second thing, proposition, I hope that you will take away from this talk, is that the decline of Congress reflects profound changes in modern culture and society. Uh, we have a system that has a lot of partisanship, uh, a lot of fractiousness, that's always present, but that it is debilitating uh, to the point of taking Congress out of the Congress of balance of power competition uh, reflects these deep changes. Who knows where the rep representative legislature came from anyway? Uh, it's, it's a long story. Uh, it's a product of social thought and political uh, competition, going back to the Greeks and Romans, running through the Magna Carta in 1512. It culminated in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, with the work of, uh, most importantly, uh, Montesquieu and Locke, Madison and the other framers. It was the institutional vehicle of Republican aspirations against the prerogatives of kings and despots, as Matthew mentioned at the beginning. The problem in a world of kings and despots was to devise a source of government authority that was secular, peaceable, and generally accepted as legitimate. <clears throat> Legitimacy meant not only that citizens would acquiesce in the government's power, obey its commands, but that the government was to some degree representative of the citizens uh, that it embodied, uh, it uh, furthered, it defended uh, the characteristic values uh, of the society and its citizens. Uh, this was done in some times and places uh, by uh, town meetings or by the representatives being all of the people. Sometimes representatives were chosen by a lot. Sometimes they chose themselves. They were self-selected elites. Those were the barons and church officials that uh, forced the Magna Carta on King John. But in recent centuries, in the, in the uh, modern world, it has increasingly been achieved through democratic choice, elections by citizens voting in geographic territories, local political jurisdictions, uh, or specific, like our Senate, or specific districts uh, that tile the nation uh, created for just uh, that purpose. The modern age has been very cruel to this great inheritance. The idea that we should be governed by elected representatives of diverse local districts who gather to make law by hammering out compromises and counting noses was conceived and developed at a time when government was naturally constrained by what economists call high transaction costs. When travel and communications were slow and costly, legislative gatherings were cr critical occasions for politicians to learn of developments in other parts of the nation to take the measure of far-flung political leaders, friends or foe, uh, to uh, forge alliances, make compromises far from the hometown gaze. When political organizing was costly, interest groups were few and far between. Established political and civic elites, including the legislature, held sway. When surveillance and law enforcement and program administration were costly, the executive could do only a few things. Modern affluence and high technology have disrupted all of these features with increasing frequency in the past uh, century. Legislators don't need to schlep to Washington to find out what's happening around the country, to form positions on political questions, to plot and dicker with their peers. They can do all that instantaneously and at much lower cost through the media, the internet, direct communications. Well-organized interest groups are able to monitor, reward, and sanction the individual legislature to a degree inconceivable in the past dramatically reducing the space for legislative deliberation and compromises. Multiplying pressures for government intervention have overwhelmed congressional capacities, the disciplines of the committee system, 
uh, the falling costs of administration have opened the way to a new system of government where lawmaking uh, avoids uh, the difficulties of legislation and is handed off <coughs> to a hierarchical, hierarchical, specialized executive branch that can add new functions essentially without limit. The legislature has, Matt, how much time do I have here? Hmm? What? A few more minutes. Um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to move uh, forward at a, very, uh, at a very rapid pace. I want to mention another aspect of the problem of the legislature today, uh, is, which is modern habits of mind. Uh, the modern mind values identity over locality, rationalism over representation, and decision over deliberation. Each of our three constitutional branches has distinctive principles of operation and legitimacy. The judiciary's principles are reason and resolution. Courts determine the facts of a dispute, resolve it uh, through deduction and inference from texts, and explain their reasoning in public. The executives are personality and action. Presidents incarnate important features of the national character, they dominate political attention and debate, and they take personal actions that settle many matters in a stroke and that redefine others by changing the facts on the ground. In the face of action, personality, rational decision, the legislature's principles, rec representation and compromise, are relatively unimpressive. Representing a geographic locality is not what it used to be because of the globalization of commerce and culture and increased personal mobility. Locality is not without its political importance, but many people today care much more about representation of their personal values, group identities, vocational, avocational interests. Legislators have very little capacity as individuals for decisive action. They can campaign, give speeches, write letters, question hearing witnesses, cast votes, which almost never resolve anything. Their primary assignment in our politics is to negotiate and horse trade with other representatives of similar, differing, and conflicting interests and values, leading to collective decisions that nobody's entirely happy with, and quite frequently, to no decision at all. Should we want to revive the representative legislature and find a room for it in modern politics? My third and final point that I would like to, that I hope you will take away, take away is that <clears throat> the task of finding a role for the legislature, warts and all, in, that is consistent with modern political values is a goal that people of conservative and libertarian persuasion uh, should particularly be attentive to and devote themselves to. As much as I like the spirit of the Tea Partiers, uh, their quest for Promethean drama uh, to take stands uh, that uh, parade their conservative principles uh, on the television uh, in the evening is completely missing the big point. Drama uh, and crisis play to the executive. If, you, if it's a crisis, the legislature loses. Legislation thrives upon routine, slow-moving slow, uh, uh, compromise. Uh, it is not a dramatic, demonstrative uh, calling, but it is an important one. Imagine that we had a world where many more decisions were moved from the executive to the Congress. <clears throat> that would be a world that would perforce be one that had a smaller government simply because of the incorrigible cumbersomeness of legislative decision making. To say that the purpose of congressional reform is to restore constitutional balance, as is often said, is something of a slight. Its real purpose is also to restore limited government, not just constitutional government, because Congress's inefficient structure and procedures are themselves vehicles of limited government. And there is one more thing to it than that. 
Congress is not just a branch of government that has to get back in the checking and balancing game. It is also a selfie of the nation as a whole. It not only represents the populace, but it also portrays the populace, not with perfect resolution by any means, but well enough to show each and every one of us how we look and where we stand in the throng of citizens who are our legal and political equals. A citizenry that permitted this portrait of its collective self to resume again a more central role in government would need to be more liberal in the classical sense than ours has become. It would need to be more patient with disagreement, including intractable disagreement. It would need to be more alert to the improving potential of dialogue itself, even when no decision ensues. It would have to be less insistent on comprehensive plans and final solutions and capacious application of state coercion uh, to cure every complaint. And it would have to become more attuned to the relative advantages of imperfect private markets and voluntary ordering. On this third of my, la my last, uh, uh, my, the third of my three takeaways, I want to leave the last word uh, to, uh, to Jim Burnham. I don't know how many people here are familiar with uh, James Burnham. Uh, he was uh, he he uh, uh, he was one of the uh, most influential lights of the National Review magazine from the mid 50s uh, to the uh, mid late uh, 1970s. He wrote some very important books uh, of uh, political theory, such as the Machiavellians, Defenders of Freedom. Uh, he wrote an immensely important book that was a bestseller at the time. Uh, uh, called uh, The Managerial Revolution in 1941. Uh, it is in, Burnham himself is enjoying a revival, and uh, The Managerial Revolution is, in fact, the cover of this week's uh, Weekly Standard uh, magazine. Uh, he wrote a book in 1959, just as Richard Neustadt, whom I mentioned, uh, was writing his playbook for the development and expansion of presidential power. Uh, Burnham is writing a book called Congress and the American tradition. He has a lot of critical things to say about Congress, and who doesn't, in the course of this book. And I want to read uh, three sentences uh, from his conclusion and make it mine. To ask whether Congress can survive is in turn equivalent to the question, can constitutional government, that is, can liberty survive in the United States? This equation between Congress and liberty may at first seem paradoxical, Undoubtedly, Congress has sometimes acted, in recent as well as in more distant times, in ways that have served to undermine both law and liberty, and it has done so both in consort with and in opposition to the other branches of government. The tie in this century and in this nation between the survival of Congress and liberty is not abstract and formal, but historical and specific. Within the United States today, Congress is, in existing fact, the prime intermediary political institution, the chief organ of the people as distinguished from the masses, the one body in which the citizenry can now appeal for redress, not merely from individual despotic events, but from the large-scale despotic innovations, trends, and principles we are beset by. Thank you very much. We, we have time for a few questions uh, before we conclude, and I believe there are some microphones uh, coming around the room. So uh, we'll start right here, this gentleman. I thank you for speaking. Uh, you mentioned compromise a lot as your key proponent uh, to this change. The other side does not compromise. They never compromise. Explain to us why compromise is not capitulation. Well, uh, compromise may be capitulation. It's, it's, always, it's always something of a capitulation. Uh, we live in a society where there are a lot of people that disagree with you and me. So how are we going to get along? And you can say, well, the other side won't compromise. Um, uh, I think that the other side 
uh, has grasped uh, the judiciary and the executive as organs because of much lesser need for compromise. And my program for reviving Congress is to teach people on my side of the aisle that don't want to compromise that it is necessary uh, to maintain social stability, which is a really, really high value, I believe, uh, but also to teach the other side. And I will tell you that the currently configured Congress, if we did not have a filibuster rule and did not have a hold rule in the Senate, the other side would be making lots of compromises. Because at this point, we can pass legislation, and there are many times that the legislation would be vetoed, but there will, there will be times when we, uh, when we publicize issues and move them up uh, to, the, uh, to the White House in a way that would be excruciatingly painful uh, to the other side. I, I think that an appropriations writer would be a pretty long shot for Planned Parenthood. But if we did not have a uh, filibuster in the Senate, the House and Senate would pass, and we had an appropriations process, they would pass a, an appropriations bill for HHS that defunded Planned Parenthood. The President does not want that to be in the center of public attention, and the Democrats would start to compromise. So comp compromise. It, it moves in both directions. It's a matter of tactics. I worked for Ronald Reagan, and he was a great compromiser. He'd sit down with Tip O'Neill, and Tip O'Neill would propose this, and he'd say, Tip, you don't understand. I just won 49 states, or was it 47 the first time? And it was my platform was no more business as usual. I'm simply not going to do things that way. So oh, Tip would kind of go back, and the next day he'd kind of come a little bit further. And um, he said, Tip, you know, I just love you to pieces, but I really don't think you were listening to me. We're not doing business as usual in Washington anymore. It's got to be this way, I really insist. And so Tip would go, okay, how about this? And Reagan would say, okay. And Tip would go, what? Wait a minute, you just said no more businesses. Wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on? He was great at it. We have to learn, we have to relearn that art. Okay. Uh, you criticized uh, Congress for passing somewhat vague general laws and then handing over to the executive branch the details to be filled in later. I'm wondering if the complexity of modern regulation does not require skills, uh, scientific uh, and otherwise, that makes some of that inevitable, at least to some degree. Uh, uh, I, I believe that it does. <clears throat> um, I, could not, uh, I could not imagine Congress making case-by-case -case judgments uh, on the uh, safety and efficacy of new pharmaceutical uh, drugs. I think that that's completely impossible. And I think if we had a national uh, referendum on whether we wanted the federal government to control the entry of new pharmaceutical drugs, it had passed by about 80%. Uh, so right there, uh, I'm all the way to a considerable amount of, uh, of delegation. Uh, but in, in the core statutes of environmental and product safety, there are many, many cases where Congress could make the judgments but does not, but simply does not, uh, uh, does not wish to uh, because they're controversial and they're difficult. Let me, um, uh, Matt mentioned I worked uh, for President uh, uh, Nixon. Uh, I have you know that I was actually involved in establishing the Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> And uh, working, this was in the early days, and we were conceiving of what the federal government's role would be in environmental policy. And we thought there'd be some regulation, but we thought that there would be a good deal of uh, uh, public finance, of taxation, uh, that a lot of the standards were going to be set by uh, Congress. Uh, we got a little bit of what we wanted. Uh, Congress uh, set uh, national tailpipe emission standards for automobiles, which hasn't, which hasn't been uh, so bad, to tell you the truth. It's been pretty good. Uh, but in general, they were not interested. Uh, President Nixon proposed a national tax on sulfur dioxide emissions. He could not find a single member of the House of either party who would sponsor that. What they wanted to do was cast a vote for clean air, and leave all of the contentious decisions to the executive branch. It was very short-sighted because you make a contentious decision. Contentious means there are some people that really favor it, and so it can be used to uh, accumulate power. I think that in uh, finance especially, 
Uh, I think that the uh, I think that the whole apparatus of financial regulation could be radically simplified and boiled down to a couple of decisions. For example, I'm I'm in favor of very high capital standards for banks. I want them to have a lot of equity behind their decisions. And once there is, then we don't have to worry about a bailout. If if they founder, if they make big mistakes, their shareholders pay for them. Congress could make that decision, and all of this uh, inane. Uh, uh, detailed supervision uh, with the minutia of the internal operations of, uh, of uh, banks, which of course Congress could never do, would be rendered completely, would be, re would be rendered superfluous. Uh oh, here comes a really, here comes a really tough one. Hello, kid. This, this, this is the reverend. Uh, so you and I are old men now, Chris, and uh, back a long time ago, I helped to edit a book called The Imperial Congress, and we missed something there, at least maybe we didn't back then, but Congress, you made a case today, first of all, it was a brilliant talk, thank you for it. Um, Congress gets something for all of this, right? They get security, they get to avoid hard decisions, they get to be ombudsmen for their constituents with the bureaucracy, they get permanence in office. So what motive in them is going to move them to take up these reforms you're proposing? <clears throat> uh, th that, is, that is the biggest and toughest question. Con is, Congress did not do these things by mistake. It did it by, by calculation. And it has created a world where uh, the incumbency advantage is very great because they do a lot of grant getting. Uh, uh, you read these big statutes and they actually control a lot that's going on in the executive branch, but they don't control policy, they control personnel. If you read the Dodd-Frank Act, you know, the first thing is there will be a woman's financial empowerment office in every financial regulatory agency downtown. And it will be headed by somebody at the GS level here and there'll be these branches and people will report to each other. Uh, they do a lot of, uh, of executive type uh, work uh, and, uh, and it works for the Congress. And the great challenge is uh, as uh, the Federalist put it, uh, to connect the interests of the man to the constitutional duties of the place. That's a rough uh, paraphrase. Uh, and this was recognized uh, from the beginning, and it's become a bigger problem. Uh, and what, what, the reason I think that this has become such an exigent problem is that I thought that a conservative Congress facing a uh, very liberal president would be a time when people would actually make some of the sacrifices. Members are going to have to give up some personal prerogatives in exchange for some pretty difficult business of engaging in collective choice uh, with a lot of people that you agree with a little bit, a lot of people you disagree with uh, a lot, uh, and it is very difficult. I do not think, I do not think that it is impossible uh, even in the context of modern affluence and politics and uh, 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 media-dominated uh, partisanship. Uh, I think the beginning is uh, the erection of a uh, hierarchy uh, that will sustain itself uh, over time uh, so that when new members come in, uh, they actually have to spend a little time uh, uh, earning, their, earning their spurs. Uh, and I think we have to be alert to opportunities. Uh, we're in a very risky situation. The extent of concentration of power uh, in this country has become enormous, and we've seen little peaks of it, the Veterans Administration scandals, uh, the incredible high-handedness of the Internal Revenue Service in the face of the revelation, revelations of their targeting conservative groups. Um, there used to be something called contempt of Congress where you could go to jail. Today, it's just contempt of Congress. It's just usual practice here uh, in Washington. And I can, imagine a, I can imagine a scandal or a crisis of some sort, uh, which actually, it, within the executive branch, that provides an opportunity for some uh, legislative, uh, uh, a, a legislative resurgence, and that the people adapt to it. Um, cultural norms, political norms, um, they often can change quickly. 
uh, they often adapt to ch circumstances changing on high very rapidly. We've seen that in the 20th century, not always for good. Uh, but I think that if a, uh, a determined majority wanted to get hold of the legislative process, uh, I could imagine a sequence of events where that would begin and people would come to appreciate some of the advantage of the legislature. But, I th but I, I, it, is a, it is a heavy lift. And the fact that Congress has essentially selected uh, for people that are used to running their own careers and using this as a base of operations as opposed to being part of a uh, collectivity uh, uh, pre presents us with a, a very big challenge. And what I wanted to say in this uh, group, I don't want to presume on the political views of an audience or so forth, uh, but it's our challenge. <laughs>